Good morning. My name is James, and it's a privilege to uh, be sharing with you this morning. Uh, I'm a second year student at SMBC. I'm a high school teacher by training, uh, and I'm based on the northern beaches in Sydney. And uh, for me, uh, I'm based on the northern beaches, but my parents live uh, up the, the other side of Gloucester, um, over the Barrington Tops there. And I thought I'd share uh, about when I was a young fella uh, and living at home with my parents, uh, I was asked to mow the lawns at home. That was my job, and I was pretty stoked with it to begin with because I thought it was better than taking the bins out. But uh, nevertheless, it was still a chore, and in time, it started, the, the thrill of it started to wear off on me. Uh, and I started to realise, hey, actually, you know what? I'm probably doing a little bit more around the house than, than my younger sister's doing. I'm probably pulling a little bit more of the weight here. And I don't know, is that just? Well, were my parents really treating me well? Well, I'll tell you at the end uh, <laughs> what, what my resolution to that question was. But um, I want us to be considering today, is God treating us well? Is God treating you well? And that's... The question that I want us to uh, consider today, we're going to be diving into Luke 15. So uh, before we start, if you go back to the very start of chapter 15, verse 1 for me, uh, it's really helpful for us to understand who Jesus is speaking to and who is in the crowd. So if you follow along, uh, verses, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. It says this, of chapter 15, 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus proceeds to tell them a parable, firstly about one lost sheep being found, then about one lost coin being found, and finally for us, one lost son being found. But I would argue that there is not just one son in this story, but there's two sons in this story. And it's significant because of the crowd of people that Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to a crowd where there are two uh, separate parts, two groups. On one side, there's the tax collectors and the sinners, people who are outcast by the religious of the day. And on the other side, you have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, uh, those who are elite and honoured in society as those who are supremely religious, obedient to God. And it's no accident that Jesus uses these two sons in the story to represent uh, the two groups of people. The younger son to represent the sinners and tax collectors, and the older son to represent the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And today, I want us to look specifically at what this parable says about how each group views their father, how each son views views their father. And we're going to start with the picture that the younger son holds, that the father is loving. The young son holds that the father is loving. And just to be clear, this isn't the picture that we get at the start of the parable, uh, quite the opposite. We, we, we see uh, that the younger brother uh, begins, if you follow along verse 11 here, um, he begins by asking his father for his share of the estate. The young brother is asking his dad to give him his inheritance while the dad is still alive. That's outrageous. In fact, more than that, he then takes it and spends it all completely irresponsibly in wild living. That's got to be one of the most dishonoring acts that someone could do to their father. Essentially, the son is saying to the father, I value your money than, more than I value you. In fact, I'd rather have your money without you, so I'll take it and run. And that's what he does. A horrible son. And it would have made the crowd angry, and it should make us angry too to, to, to hear that story. But I want us to sit for a moment and consider what Jesus is saying about the, the sinners and collect, tax collectors in this runaway act. That they never had the right view of their father to begin with. They're like a little kid that snatches their birthday present and runs off to, to play with it by themselves. Uh, they want the gift without the giver. They want the gift without the giver. And isn't that us? 
Isn't that our natural tendency? To breathe in the air that God has given us, through the lungs that God has given us, to power the body that God has given us, and then to walk away without acknowledging or thanking or appreciating him. In fact, I think this is our natural state as sinners before a holy God. But thankfully, the the story does not end there. And uh, this heinous act of the younger son sets the scene for verse 17. So follow along with me in verse 17. Uh, When he came to his senses, so the son has this realization. What does he realize? He realized that my father's servants have food to spare. And here I am starving to death. He realizes that his father is a loving man. That his father was so loving that he even treats his workers well. And that those workers were in a far better condition than the son was in all his so-called freedom. He realized that by running away from the father in pursuit of a better life, that he had run away from the most loving relationship that he had. From the one who loved him abundantly and provided for him accordingly. What a realization that his father is loving. But more than that, just that he is loving, uh, he presumes on the father's grace. So the son plans to go back, and again, uh, following along, um, he plans to go back and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. It's a, it's a picture of repentance, right? Humility. The moment that the son realizes that, uh, how wrong he was to leave the father. And that it's only by his father's mercy that they might be reconciled again. The son realizes that he needs his father. And his father's response to this runaway son? The father is gracious. The father is loving. Forgiveness and mercy flow as the father welcomes his son back home with open arms to embrace him and hold him close. The hurt and pain that the son has caused is washed away by the love and the grace of the father. And in the moment that the son sees the grace of the father, the son loves his father too. The son appreciates his father's kindness and is grateful for his father's mercy, adores the presence of the father. Is this the most beautiful image? Beautiful image of a father's love for his son. The anger that we had at the son running away is overshadowed by the love of the father and the grace that we see the father offering this son. The younger son sees that his father is loving. That his father is loving. But to begin with, we said that this parable was not just about one lost son, but there is another son, uh, the older son, who, when he hears that his younger brother has returned, is angry. He's angry that the younger son should be welcomed back uh, after he's hurt his father so much. It's not right. It's not just. It's not fair. I mean, the older brother, he's been slaving away for, for his father for all these years, while the younger brother has just been off living it up in a, wild, in a different country. And who's the one that gets the party? It's not the younger son that deserves the party. Surely it's him. It's the older son, right? And it gets to the heart of how the older brother sees his father. Where the younger brother sees his father as loving, the older brother sees his, son, his father as harsh. The older brother sees his father as harsh. Following along with me in verse 29. Um, All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat. The older brother sees himself as a slave of the father. 
And by seeing himself as a slave, it makes the father the boss who he's working for. There's almost like an employee-to-employer relationship going on, a transaction, if you will, where if I work so hard for you, surely then I deserve payment in return. That's what I deserve. It's a transaction. You and me, Dad. Dad, is that what a father and son's relationship is based on, a wage agreement? Is that the foundation of a family? We all know that's not true. It's not based on transaction, but based on love. And yet, because of the son's view as he, of his father as a boss and him as the worker, it makes it completely unfair that the brother who hasn't done any work would be paid more than him. It's harsh, it's unjust, and the brother believes he deserves better. And isn't it so interesting that that's where the parable ends? That the parable ends with the father going out to the son, welcoming him into the party, and the older brother refuses. The parable ends with the older brother outside, viewing his father as harsh and unjust. And that's where... We come together and I ask you, is God treating you well? Is God treating you well? What picture would come to mind if I asked you to describe God? Because we noted that Jesus is sharing this this parable to two groups of people. Uh, He's the younger son to represent the sinners and tax collectors, uh, people that know that they have done wrong, uh, that also know that they can't earn the love of God, And so they come to him in humility and repentance to the God who is graciously waiting to welcome them with open arms. They see God as loving. But Jesus also uses the older son to represent those Pharisees and tax collectors. People who think that they can earn their way into a relationship with God by their moral compliance, by their good works, for being a good person. And so their moral compliance turns into a joyless task. It's something that they must do in order to reap their reward later. It's a job for them. And God is devalued by them to simply being the harsh taskmaster who will judge if they've eventually done enough to receive their pay. Friends, we will never do enough. We never have and never will do enough to earn love. And so the older son refuses to enter the party of their father's generosity and they are not part of the celebration. And sadly, for for us who are a part of the church, we have a tendency to slip into these patterns of thinking from time to time. We have a tendency to to think that we are doing good things uh, that will save us. And so I ask you, is God treating you well? Because I think that this question, or at least your answer to it, will help us to diagnose our attitudes toward God, our Father. Some will say, yes, God is good. I love him. He's treating me well. Life's tough. Life's really tough. But I'm so grateful to be doing life with God. It's far better to be doing it with God. And I need him and adore him. And yet for others, uh, is God treating you well? We might respond by saying, it's tough. It's tough to do everything that God asks of us. But then when I think I'm at at church every week uh, and and I'm serving in the community, so I'm doing better than most of the people down in town, so I know that I probably deserve to be rewarded. This is the response of an older brother. The response of someone who's disconnecting themselves from their heavenly father, who who won't join in the heavenly party, that at some stage in our lives is a danger for Christians to slip in, for us to slip in to this sinful uh, pattern of thought, where we forget our need for God's grace and slip into a mindset where, yeah, that attendance at church, our hosting Bible study, baking cookies for the neighbours or volunteering in the community, 
might earn our salvation. We never earned it, we never will, and we need to return to God in humility, like the younger son, crying out our, our sorry and repentance uh, for viewing God as simply a taskmaster and not the loving father who adores us and welcomes us with open arms. So I ask us to check our heart and to ask upon God's grace. Now, we've well established that there's two groups of people that uh, Jesus is speaking to. Uh, the, and there are two responses. Some people love Jesus and, and some people don't. And I think for some in the room might potentially be saying, I can't love Jesus because I don't really know him. I don't really know him. And to that, I want to introduce Jesus, something different, as the true older brother. Hang on. Yes, the older brother. The older brother who we were just saying that uh, his attitude stinks, right? Well, actually, Jesus is the true, better older brother. Follow with me. Because Jesus is not like the older brother in the parable. You see, where every human has enjoyed God's good gifts without acknowledging him, the giver, Jesus acknowledged the giver. Jesus did not sin and has always lived in accordance with the Father's will, in relationship with the Father, just like the older brother living on the farm with the Father. But in the story, the cost for the older brother to welcome his younger brother back into his family, was extremely high. Not only did the brother need to give his younger brother for all the hurt that he's caused his family, but further, by having his, son welcome, uh, his brother welcome back into the family, he was now a son and had a new claim to the inheritance in which he had previously taken. Now think about this. Where is the younger son's claim to the inheritance coming from now? It's coming from the older brother's portion. The cost for the older brother to welcome the younger brother back into the family was very high. The younger brother, so the older brother saw this as completely unfair. He was angry and he protested outside. And friends, where the, where the older brother protested that he should not have to pay for the sake of his brother, Jesus did not. Jesus lived the life that we could not live in obedience to the Father, and yet he died the death that we deserved. But he did not protest that it was unfair. He did not cry for justice, but instead was pinned to the cross, paying the price willingly. That is love. And that is the love of a brother who wants you and I in his family. Who has already paid for your redemption and my redemption so that you and I can say to him, I love you, Jesus. I want you and I need you. Jesus is the better, true older brother. So as we worship God who adopts us as his sons and daughters, let us act like children, in dependence upon his grace and adoration of his love. Not like hired laborers or workers. Jesus already is the perfect older brother. We, we don't need to be the older brother. We already have one. So let's act like a younger brother in repentance and humility. We can't pay for our redemption by good works and moral compliance. We never will be able to. I began by asking whether my parents had been treating me well in getting me to mow the lawns, uh, which took longer than my sister's duties. And my conclusion most certainly is a resounding, yeah, of course they were treating me well. Um, you see, while my parents asked me to mow the lawns and contribute to the house, uh, they also loved me dearly. They loved me dearly. And so it left me with the option of seeing myself as either a son or a worker, which left me viewing my parents as either loving me or harsh. And to be honest, once I considered the 
deep love of my parents for me, uh, mowing the lawn even became enjoyable. And I hope that we, as we consider our Heavenly Father and the love that He has for us as His sons and daughters, uh, we might find following and serving Jesus as truly enjoyable. Can I pray? Let's. Father, I thank you so much that uh, you love us so deeply, that you are not willing to leave us in our rebellion, uh, in our sin, Lord, uh, in our sinful nature, but you, Jesus, came to earth in order to make things right, in order to, to pay the price, in order to welcome us into your family, Lord, that now, as we accept your invitation, we can be accepted as sons and daughters of you, the living God. We thank you and praise you, Lord. And as we head out this week, we just ask that that would be a reality in our hearts, that we would serve you with joy, Father. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.